so I think there's a lot that anaesthetists can learn from surgery and surgery can learn from um, anaesthetists. And so I, I dual trained because I knew that I wanted to do trauma um, surgery, but when I trained, there was almost no critical care in the surgical curriculum. Um, and there's a lot more than there is now. Um, so I did a bit of anaesthetics and then felt like I was more dangerous than if I'd never done any at all. And so went on and completed um, my fellowship. Not that I would advocate necessarily doing that um, now, but I think it does give, you know, understanding critical care and doing a strong stint on, on critical care and in anaesthesia actually is, is very useful. Um, for surgery and especially I think for very different types of surgery where it's not just a purely academic anatomical technical exercise but more but you know has to be tailored to the patient um, I think you know if you think about what makes mastery of surgery you know people talk about oh you know I've done 100 aneurysms or I've done um, you know, 20 carotid surgeries or 90 hip replacements or something. I think, you know, you can have done 90, but they could all have been completely the same. You know, they could all have done, gone fine and not a problem. Um, I think, you know, when you talk about mastering surgery, it's actually about mastering complications, knowing what can go wrong and how to get yourself out of trouble during surgery. How to, min how to use surgery to minimize post-operative complications um, and, you know, contextualizing any complications in terms of the patient's general state and, that, and things. I think, you know, in day-to-day -day practice, it helps a lot because, you know, like any anaesthetist, I can listen to the beeps of the machine and I know what's going on. So I have a constant situational awareness around me and I can hear the anaesthetist whispering you know get some NORAD or something like that and I can hear it going in or or I instinctively know how many bags of blood into a resuscitation they are because I'm listening to them. Uh, I don't think you have to do, necessarily do the anaesthesia to do that but I think you can train yourself to be situationally aware in the operating room but, you know we, we often get completely task focused on what we're doing but so much of Certainly trauma surgery, emergency surgery, you know, you need to tailor what you do to the patient. You know, I'm not a fan of the blood brain barrier drape. You know, I think, you know, it's better that we can both see each other, communicate with each other. Surgeons can see how the patient's doing that. Sort of thing. So would I advocate doing anesthetic training for surgery? No. Um, would I advocate having a good understanding of critical care for most surgeons, I think, certainly, but certainly anyone who's doing emergency surgery. Yeah, um, so, I mean, that's a massive question, you know, how do you manage your time? How do you prioritise um, things? You know, how do you even decide what to take on versus not to take on? I think time management personal management is really important for everybody, you know, whether you're a junior doctor or a senior consultant. And I think it's something that people have to actively work at throughout their careers because nobody's brilliant at it, you know, let's face it. Uh, you know, everybody needs help uh, in doing these things. And it's important, I think, mostly that you don't let one part of your life suffer because of all the others you know and and especially that relates to you know making sure you're devoting enough time to your family or your personal life or your or, you know sorting your finances out and and things as you are to to the rest of it so you know balance is difficult time management is difficult i think the other thing is that when you're a junior doctor you know for a lot of the time you're told what to do and when to do it you know you know when you have to turn up you know what you have to do Yes, you have to make a list and prioritize those tasks and tick them off. But, um, you know, for the most part, it's not self-directed time management. Whereas as you get more and more senior, perhaps if you do a bit of research or something that is self-directed, all of a sudden you've got all this stuff to do and nobody is telling you when you have to do it, except, you know, the odd deadline will, will appear when you do have to do it. So well, often, you know, this need to time management just gets dumped on you as a consultant or near consultant you have to work out how to do it quite quickly um 
how do I do it? So, I mean, I can, I don't think, you know, my system is tailored to me, you know, when I work best, how I work best and everybody will be different. I have a big to-do list, which is a text file, basically, which I keep in a program called Evernote. Um, and I can access that from anywhere. So I know, you know, what I've got, my whole long list of things that I have to do. And I, um, I look at it, you know, and prioritize what I'm going to do, you know, a couple of big things I have to do with that day and some small things. Um, so I try and, you know, separate out the big pieces of work that needs real thinking to them from the, you know, routine answer a few emails, you know, that sort of, um, thing. I, I don't do any useful work after lunch, really. So if I'm going to do solid pieces of work, I need to block that off either, you know, before work or in the morning, if I'm not, you know, clinical in the morning. So anything like checking emails, answering emails, that sort of thing goes to after lunch. And in fact, for the most part, apart from urgent emails, I'll only answer emails once or twice a week. Um, uh, you know, I'll read things to firefight and things, but I'll only answer emails a couple of times a week because otherwise it just ends into a complete time suck or, you know, and you end, you end up replying to emails and getting just as many emails back, but you haven't um, really achieved anything. And then, you know, I think uh, choosing which projects you're going to do, you know, is difficult. I think as a junior, certainly you have to be very open to taking on work you know you you shouldn't take on work if you don't think you can finish it and if you do take on something you absolutely have to finish it but you know you need to be open to opportunities and being able to say yes you know saying no is not that much of an option as a as a junior unless you you know you've got so much on and you're clearly producing that you can say you know i've got to deal with this first, so i won't be able to to do it. I think as you drift up more senior, um, right, you you can be more selective uh, in what you choose. But then you have to know what your goal is. You know what are you actually trying to build towards, and how will you? How will what this piece of work we're doing now? How is that going to build towards what you want to do in the future? And that means you need a fairly clear idea about you know, what direction you're going in, what you need to focus on this year, what outputs you really need to have, you know, before you say yes to things, especially it's quite easy to be ego driven in, well, it's quite easy to be ego driven in a lot of things in surgery um, and in medicine, but it's quite easy to be ego driven because it's nice to be asked to do something. And so the automatic answer is yes. And then, you know, you don't do it very well or you don't do it or, or even worse, probably you've spent a lot of time doing it, but actually it doesn't do you any good in terms of advancing your own, you know, not necessarily career, but your own areas of interest and building on work that you've done before to produce you know, a solid foundation for yourself. Um, so I don't think I would change very much. I think um, I think I've been very lucky, um, you know, in terms of how my career has progressed and what I've been allowed to do because I've, you know, very much followed a non-standard training pathway. On the other hand, I think if you can focus on what you want to do in the long term, you know, and you put in the work for it, I think you know, a lot, and you are open to opportunities, then I think you can make your own luck to a, you know, to a greater or lesser extent, obviously. Um, I think the things that I would do differently, so, um, I think, and I think mainly it comes down to understanding some of the things that I understand uh, now, you know, a bit earlier on in your, in your, in my career, you know, I think things like, you know, you don't, there's nothing special about being a consultant or an attending, you know, it is just a title. Um, 
and you know for, for a lot of the time you know we spend a lot of time saying you know i want to be a surgeon or i want to be a, a hepatologist i want to be a consultant you know everything will be all right once i finish training or you know once i've i've done this and you know you get you rush people rush through their training i mean i didn't thankfully but you know you you have this idea that you want to be something and actually you get to be that person and then you don't you know there's nothing beyond it you know there's just being that person which is it's vacuous i think being able to knowing what you want to do you know which patients you want to look after what type of you know surgery you want to do or how you want to progress that surgery or um you know whether you want to be involved in safety or whether you want to go you know out of medicine into law or something like that you know it's what do you want to do with those skills and with what you've done and, and how then do you want to develop as a as a person uh and then i think the other thing you know which i guess i mentioned before is to you know learn that you need to take ego out of a lot of things that that you do and actually you know the more that you share the more that you collaborate the more that you work with each with other people the more that you recognize how you know you can be manipulated by you know having your your ego massaged or how you can make things more about you than they should be about other people you know i think uh, i think that's a lesson that has to be learned constantly i think men are particularly bad at it surgeons are particularly bad at it um and um and so i think it is useful to you know constantly i mean i don't think you know as a surgeon goes i don't have a big ego you know i don't scratch around the place but i'm you know i think it affects us all and you know to be a surgeon ultimately you know you have to have something about you that allows you to slice into something into somebody you know without even thinking about it um and that's not normal and you know and i think you need to constantly work on um making sure that you are behaving normally in all aspects of of your life so um yeah a bit of a woolly answer i think for you but i think you know keeping being personally grounded is important um you know and the more that you succeed the more that it's important that you are remain personally grounded <laughs> So I love writing grants at the weekend. There's nothing I would do better than write a grant. No, I hate, <laughs> I hate them with a, a passion. It's such a time suck. No, so where possible, weekends are you know complete downtime where you're not really doing anything um, apart from you know hanging out with my wife and daughter and you know maybe you know going to markets in east london going out for lunch something like that you know ideally not involving any kind of work related activity so um yeah i would you know i'd love to say that we go to loads of art galleries and theater shows or we go out you know mountain biking in the country and that sort of thing but it's uh yeah mostly it's it's switch off time and you know doing family stuff <music> Um, yeah, so I thought <laughs> quite a lot about this question, and I, I'm not sure I can come up with a a particular answer. I mean, um, the thing, the holiday the holiday that affected my life the most was um, going as a medical student. I went I went to Jamaica was on my elective, and then we went island hopping for a bit after that. And I met my wife. Uh, I mean, she was my wife then, but I met the uh the girl who then became my wife so that was probably the one that has affected me the most um reading you know again i don't read lots of in-depth but most of my the books that i read and the films you know music that i listen to is very escapist you know fiction and um that sort of thing i think the the two books that i would probably say affected me the most um so one is a book called and we again we talked about ego uh, a bit earlier one is called ego is the enemy by ryan holiday and you know it very much talks about you know how it 
it's not just about ego it's about you know what what you want to become how you want to be and and really concentrating on this idea of doing something rather than being something or, or someone and how you how you can be um, released from your ego if you like and I think help others as well in that in that way the other one probably more um, you know applied to the job there are a couple of books one of them uh, was called Nexus uh, I forget the author actually the other is um, linked by Alberto Barabasi which are books which essentially talk about um, the interconnectedness of things and how complex systems are how they evolve and how they um, function or you know where their points of failure are and how you can identify points of failure so it talk you know we're very reductionist in medicine you, know, you see a low blood pressure you give something to put the blood pressure high um, you, know, you, you know which may be a presser or a thing but we can look at one blood pressure we we don't look at you know all the interplay factors necessarily it's, you know we're very linear thinking we can cope with one or two variables at any one time we're very diffi difficult for us to see how that low blood pressure or our action to elevate it will affect patients the next day or or you know one week later um, and you know the, how the systems that we deal with all the time like inflammation and coagulation and things have evolved into these complex dynamic systems that are self-regulating in many ways but can fail so it was their introductory books to essentially complexity science um, and complexity and we see complexity in everything that we deal with both in a biological sense around you know complexity of coagulation or um but also there's complexity around how an operative team comes together and works together efficiently or you know a whole hospital functions how you deliver population health for a healthcare system um and and then especially when you're talking about critical incidents or crises you know and, and how you respond to you know what are the failure points in teams or in crisis situations what are the failure points in biology what are your failure points personally you know when you have a critical stresses applied to key points where you are you know generally we are robust but in specific points for each of us will lead us to be quite fragile and, and complex systems are defined as being robust but fragile and so i think you know it's it was very useful for me to it was an airplane book actually i picked it up in the airport and i read it on a plane and it you know by the time the plane had landed i was thinking about almost everything um differently but i think not thinking linearly and understanding the complexity of, of what's around us and how that should affect our ability to cause to provide solutions i think is very useful for everyone mm -hmm.